There's a pretty one, Ulysses. There it is. Hey, BookTube, I'm Sean the Book Maniac. Welcome back to my channel. Uh, I'm going to talk about this is definitely not a review. This is just, I finished this book late last night. Dear friend from my life, I write to you in your life by Ian Lee. I heard it pronounced as, uh, most people pronounce it Yian, but I think the correct pronunciation from several reputable pronunciations websites might be Ian, without the Y being sounded. I will pronounce it Ian Lee, and somebody please correct me, somebody who knows more than I do. I don't know how to review this book. I think it might be an unreviewable book. I haven't read Eric Carl Anderson's blog review, but I know that this was his top read of a couple of years ago, and that's why I bought it, and that's why I was kind of nervous to read it, because Eric and I don't always agree. And I finished it just before midnight last night. Yin Li is a Chinese-American writer. She was born in 1972 in Beijing, moved to America in 1996, and has lived there ever since. She was a scientist. Uh, immunologist at, for quite a while, for about 10 years in America, and then she switched. Uh, she uh, did a complete flip and uh, became a writer, went to the University of Iowa uh, Writers' Workshop, etc., and has written many stories which have been published all the best places like The New Yorker and whatnot, and several novels. Her debut story collection was a a Thousand Years of Good Prayers, and it was compared to Chekhov and Alice Munro. Well, but high praise indeed. This is a collection of memoiristic essays published in 2017, and it is, to the degree that it's possible to say what this book is about, it's about Ian Lee recovering from a complete mental... In the old days, we used to call, call it mental breakdown, but... In 2012, she became extremely mentally ill and was hospitalized uh, more than once for uh, after suicide attempts. And this is about that time of her life, but it's about so much more, and it's not your typical memoir of recovery. Uh, those of you that know me know that I hate memoirs, and I actually don't really get along with personal essays either. I find them all me, me, me. I like fiction, so it was a lot for me to try this. And it ended up being a five-star read. I can't say I loved it. It's much more, it's different than that. So the reason that this has sucked me right inside its pages and Ian Lee's uh, confoundingly wise and maddeningly uh, unknowable, unrelatable insights is she just writes in a completely different way than I, I don't think I've ever read prose like this. So, for example, she really writes about emotions in a detached way that you kind of think about Asian perspective on stuff, whether it's Buddhism or what. This is not a spiritual book, not at all. I was deeply fascinated and ultimately it completely went over my head what she had to say about melodrama in one essay because she seemed to be talking about it in a way that I had never encountered melodrama being conceived of, conceptualized, interrogated. The prose is not dense, it's really readable, but I feel like, I felt a lot of the time like I was listening to very understandable writing about stuff that I have spent a lot of time thinking about, reading about, writing about, but I was, the messages were coming to me underwater, and it was, and, and this, and I'm not complaining, <laughs> this was just, oh. The main reason that I love this book, there you go, there's the word. The main reason why this is going to become such an important book for me is Ian Lee doesn't say it quite so sentimentally, quite, uh, she doesn't say it hokily at all, but I'm going to. She saved her life by reading. She 
poo-pooed and kind of ignored the psychiatric suggestions about how she should recover. And when she was institutionalized, she would bring with her the letters of Catherine Mansfield and John McGarren's autobiography. And she would just read and read and read in a way that, well, it saved her life. And she was able to, it's not explicitly stated, but the book was published two years ago. She's since published another novel that she recovered. She moved through and passed and over her ordeal through reading as if her life depended on it, because it did, the lives of other writers and their letters and their fiction. And the way she writes about reading, and the way she writes about other writers, including one writer that she developed a personal... All of the writers were dead except for one, William Trevor, and she formed a friendship with him. And the way she writes about these writers, whether they were alive or dead at the time that she was reading them so intensely, it affected me so profoundly that I just don't know how to talk about it. But she has made me want to read you know I read it's kind of my life but I don't read like she read like she reads and she just has opened up uh, she's cracked open something in my brain and maybe down here I could that just makes me want to be a better deeper reader and it made, as I was reading it, I was thinking about this article. I stumbled upon, in preparing to read Valeria Ruiselli's The Lost Children Archives, which I haven't gotten to yet, I stumbled across a review essay on the web, and I'll put a link in the show notes. It's on a website called Splice from the UK, and the reviewer is Anna McDonald. And I just fell into this review in a very similar way. Let me just read a, a, a couple excerpts. Some books, my favorite sort, I like to read inside out. I want to excavate a deep topography of the narrative via others that have inspired it and from which it draws breath. To that end, I keep an index card and an HB pencil handy. I note down references to texts or authors, phrases or images that persistently return. I'm not an underliner, preferring when I reread to do so with a fresh eye. But occasionally, when the need is great, I will buy another edition of a book, which I then mark up freely. And then she goes on to list several writers that she has read this way. W.G. Sebald, who in his book The Immigrants had read, I don't know most of these writers, Altenberg, Trackel, Wittgenstein, Friedel, Hassan Clever, and then uh, Kostler, Benjamin, Zweig. And then she'll go and read all those writers at the same time that she's reading the book. And she says, in my copy of Tedru Cole's Blind Spot, I find an index card covered on both sides with names and titles. Among them, Saint Soleil, Edna O'Brien, Iliad, Caravaggio, etc., etc. She goes on a few sentences later. Such books are embedded within particular histories of thought and representation, and there is an archival quality to this reading in reverse, which builds an archive of the text and documents the experience of reading and rereading it. On the bookshelves in the study, although it disrupts the otherwise strict alphabetical order, I keep Conrad, Kafka, Nabokov, and Wittgenstein along Siebold. Reading Blind Spot, I wish we kept a Bible in the house. I pause frequently, regardless, to pull down from the shelf John Berger's understanding of photograph, to listen to Brahms, to look for Emily Dickinson's complete poems, which isn't where it should be. And it just goes on. And that essay, I didn't even, I stopped reading when she started to talk about Lost Children Archives because I, I want to read it first. But that really captured my imagination and really resonates with Ian Lee's deep reading. A deep reading is my word because I lack the vocabulary. And I have a really neurotic relationship with underlining my books. If it's a beat up old copy of a novel, I will underline it. Otherwise, if for some reason I need to keep a record, I'll just type some notes on my iPad. But I think I have broken through 
by reading this book. So about halfway through, I started underlining and writing notes. And that's when the reading, my reading, really deepened. There's some notes in the margin. Because the, she writes about, among many other writers, Philip Larkin. She doesn't mention his decades-long friendship with Barbara Pym. It was a, by correspondence only. I think they met once just before Barbara Pym died, but they had a very rich correspondence, which was quoted in a biography of Barbara Pym's I wrote. And I'm reading a novel by Barbara Pym, so there was all these bells going off, and there's things in the margins. Uh, so this is kind of a... It's kind of scattered and feels disorganized, but I hesitate to characterize it as a, a, a mess. I just think I don't understand the structure. I trust this writer so much with what she's saying and what she's making it difficult for me to grasp. This is a book that I will return to again and again. It's just, it was almost scary in places. It was so important to my life as a reader. I'm just so excited about this book. And I think that to read it, to really, I mean, you have to be in the right space. I guess I was. It's been on my shelf for a couple of years, I think, ever since Eric talked about it, a year and a half. And every time there's a readathon or something that it fits, I pull it out and I, well, I hold it up to the camera and I say, well, maybe I'll get to this, but I, Eric loved it and it's kind of autobiographical memoir. I don't know if it's gonna be for me. Well, it was the right time and It wasn't an easy read, and it might be the kind of book that you, that you might pick up and put down, pick up and put down. And I didn't, I only got a fraction of the insights that she was uh, trying to convey. So uh, th another thing to say about Ian Lee is that she only writes in English, and she is only written as a creative writer of fiction and uh, anything other than academic writing. She has only written in English, which is controversial for her audience back in China, and even for Chinese Americans. And she she has a, devotes an essay to writing in a second language that was just fascinating. That was one of the ones that was easiest to grasp. Uh, there's often times where she uh, writes in a way that almost feels like it's a cone. Is that the pronunciation for the Buddhist cone of just kind of a riddle that has no answer? Or she kind of flips words, there's a, there's a word for this rhetorical device, which I don't have in my head, but where you just kind of flip <coughs> the, the expression to make it more enigmatic and interesting. But sometimes I just thought, oh, Ian, I don't know if that's really very clever. I don't know, maybe it just over my head. And I had moments of that, and that also made me engage with the text, because they weren't, there weren't very many. But just to give you a sample, I'm going to read a couple passages. This is one of the last times, maybe the last time, that she met William Trevor, who she became friends with, and she was in her late 30s at this time, and he was in his early 80s. Only by fully preparing oneself for people's absence can one be at ease with their presence. A recluse, I have begun to understand, is not a person for whom a connection with another person is unattainable or meaningless, but one who feels she must abstain from people because a connection is an affliction or worse an addiction. She writes a lot about the rivalrous friendship between Catherine Mansfield and Virginia Woolf. This is, uh, I thought, was a stunning passage about reading their diaries or their letters and knowing more about what they thought and felt about each other than either of them knew the other person thought or felt about them. These two extraordinary women would never know what they had or had not said about each other in their private papers. Not knowing transforms them into characters. To see the context of other people's lives when that context is kept away from those who live in it, a reader always wins in the end. A reader has infinite time to interfere with the characters' lives. Well, so she is inviting us, really, to read her and make a character of her and she is firmly embedded as a writer and a character in my reading life from here on in folks i haven't read any of her fiction i have the newest one which is apparently based on even 
setting aside her own mental health struggles. Uh, just a devastating uh, a tragedy that befell her very recently, apparently, the suicide of her son, and it's based on that. And I just know that from what I've read here, that it's not going to be a sentimental, typical novel that's uh, melodramatic or uh, trying to uh, make me cry, but that it's something deeper, richer, and on, more unforgettable. So, like Anna Thomas, whose review I quoted from earlier, I feel that I'm going to have a shelf that's going to become my Ian Lee bookshelf, where I'm going to have her books, and the books that inspired her books, and maybe the books that inspired those books all clustered together. She has a reading list at the back, and she, you, you get a feel for the book, the, the writers she's reading, and I want to read all those writers, and that is another layer of the almost indescribable enjoyment I got out of this book. I, this is the best I can do the day after I put this book down, but I just really want to get this on your radar because this book is the kind of reading experience that has the potential to change the way you read from here on in, and that's the gift it has uh, offered me. Huh. That's all I know how to say. Thanks for watching.